right, so we're starting a new series called Seven. It's about the seven letters written to the seven churches in Revelation. And the question that I want us all to answer through this series is, if Jesus were to write you and I a letter, what would it say? If he was to write Connection Christian Church a letter, what would it say? And I think that maybe the best way that we can kind of get into this series is if you can recall a time in your life when you were excited to get a letter, right? And maybe that time is right now. Let me explain. Remember back in the day as a kid, and, and you wanted to be the first one to get to the mailbox because inside of that glorious piece of metal was something that might have your name on it. And as a kid, you probably knew that this was going to be from grandma or grandpa, right? And there might be a card inside of it. And this card is going to have a, a letter written specifically to you. There might even be some cash tucked inside of this card because grandparents are good like that. Today we run to the mailbox. Well, we don't even run, do we? Some of us like, you know, if I don't have to hit that mailbox today, I'm all right with that. Because chances are inside of that mailbox are going to be a few items. Number one, junk mail. Right? Oh, yay, hey, you know, I, if I run down to the car dealership, I may have a key to unlock this car. You get one of those? You qualify for your very own credit card at 20% interest. Get one of those, right? I've even gotten ones that they appear like they're from your car company. Like, oh, your good news, your warranty has the opportunity to be extended. Yeah, right. But the other stuff, the other stuff is worse, right? Because the other stuff are people who want your money, right? Here's a bill for your electricity. Here's a bill for your gas and your trash and your cable and your internet and your cell phone. And mail isn't near as exciting as it used to be. But every once in a while, you see inside of your mailbox more of a square-shaped envelope. It's probably colored. Looks like something you'd pick up at the Hallmark store. It's handwritten. To your name and you're thinking somebody cares right this gets amped up even more so if it's around like say your birthday or Christmas oh somebody sent me a letter and we get excited about that what would your excitement level be like if Jesus wrote you and I a letter well he did let me explain we're gonna be in Revelation chapter 1 to start off with and in chapter 1, we're going to set the stage for what's about to unfold in the next two chapters and the next seven letters to seven different churches. So page 664 in the Bibles we provide if you want to follow along there. And I'm going to read this passage to you uh, in, in small bits, and then we're going to kind of go back and hit some of the high points. Chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to the servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Well, what we gather from just this introduction, I wish the introductions were different in letters we write today. We sign our name at the bottom. Anybody ever go to the end of the letter first? to see who wrote it before you go back to the beginning? It makes so much more sense. Like, hey, this is John. I'm writing to you. Like, okay, got it. All clear. We can go on to the body of the letter now. So John is writing this letter to the seven churches, but it's on behalf of Jesus who is giving a revelation. That means he's revealing something new. It's, it's your peek behind the curtain for new information. And so this is an exciting piece of information about to be revealed. But it's not just from Jesus. Jesus gets it from God and then sends it via a messenger, an angel, to John, 
who's now giving it to the churches. It's a long, uh, drawn-out process, but what you and I need to know is that this letter, this information, actually comes from God by the way of Jesus. And then John, some believe to be a number of different characters, but probably the most likely is the Apostle John. So when Jesus goes out, he recruits his 12 uh, apostles to follow after him. One of those is John, the one he loved. John writes the Gospel of John that talks about his uh, interaction with Jesus throughout his life. And then we've got the letters 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John that he also wrote. And, uh, and John was, was the one that was supposed to be passing along this bit of information. Now you can see here that this is also called not just a revelation, but a book of prophecy. Words that are prophetic. In other words, they have not yet come to pass. Now if you're familiar with the prophecy of the Old Testament, the prophets, you realize that there was oftentimes layers of information given to the people. Revelation is no different. Revelation is talking about a time that's yet to come in the far off future. Revelation is talking to the, the exact context of people about stuff that is about to take place. And it's pulling in from the Old Testament a lot of imagery. And so when you and I, we, we read this, if we don't have a good understanding of the Old Testament going in, we kind of miss the mark and we get even more confused. Because we open up the book of Revelation when we can't sleep. And then we find out that our, our dreams are weirder than we started off with. Like, what is this stuff? What does this mean? What's the context going in? And so hopefully we can grab some of that imagery as we're going through, but we're just hitting the first three chapters, so we're not going to get into a bulk of that. But here we are in this part, talking about prophecy, things that are not yet to come, but also prophetic is, is foretelling the Word of God. So that's kind of like me right here today telling you about the Word of God. And so he says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written. So three things that you and I need to grasp just from this very beginning piece. Read, hear, and keep. Read, hear, and keep. Now, the people at this point in time probably had a very low reading level. Okay, so about 15% literacy rate. And so the way that they would get the information from a letter is somebody would read it aloud to them. So blessed is those who read. So right now, today, you are sitting there absor observing and absorbing the things that are proclaimed to you. So there's somebody telling you and you're receiving it. And then the, the real kicker here is those who obey it, who keep it. You could say the same thing in this math equation. Information plus application equals trans transformation. So regardless of whether you're telling your kids at home or you're telling an employee or a coworker at the office, if you give them information but they never apply it, it only leads to frustration. We've been there. Chances are you have been the object of somebody's frustration because they have passed along information and you have failed to apply it in your life. So maybe what you need to hear today is this simple uh, bit of information that I need to get myself to a place where I can hear the Word of God being proclaimed. And if I can hear it, the next phase for me is to apply it. Maybe that's for you here today. But it also goes to say, for the time is near. And for those of you who have grown up in the church or been around the church, you've probably been hearing this for a long time. Jesus is coming soon. Okay, so that means you need to make sure you make your bed at night, in the morning when you get up. You need to make sure your teeth are brushed. You need to make sure the house looks good because Jesus is coming soon. Now we're actually talking about our own lives, right? Like all the stuff that's been stuck in our own little personal closet. It's time to go through the closet because Jesus is coming and I don't want him to open the door. Because that avalanche is just going to right on out. But the reality is this isn't... This isn't necessarily saying, hey, by the way, Jesus is coming tomorrow, because no one knows the time or the place, right? Unless there's an eclipse or an earthquake or some hurricane coming, then somebody knows the time or the place. But in this situation, it's actually saying that you and I, we need to be ready. The time is coming soon. We have to be ready, be on guard, be alert, have our, our stuck, stuff in order, our ducks in a row, because we never know. Revelation 4 through 8, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. So John is writing to a specific group of churches, at least it appears that way. 
Uh, let me show you on a map where these seven churches are. Uh, Ephesus, the first one we're going to talk about today, modern day Turkey. It's like the epicenter of the area. And so we can see, maybe you can't read all of the names that are up there, but you see the circular pattern to where those locations are at. These letters were actually written to seven different churches that are in a circular pattern because these letters are meant to be delivered circularly. That means even though I'm writing to Ephesus, this letter to Ephesus is eventually going to go to Pergamum and to Smyrna and to Philadelphia. Okay, you're getting the point that this letter is for you, but it's not just for you. This letter is for Ephesus, but this letter is also for you and I. Because it's meant to be circular. And so when the letters were delivered, they would kind of make this path. And the seven letters to the seven churches, you need to know uh, the number seven stands for completeness. All right, a totality. So there are a lot more than just seven churches. Right? There's a lot more than seven churches today. But when you say seven, you're saying all of the churches. So there's a, a completeness in what's being presented. So in these seven letters are some characteristics that I bet we can find in any church that we go to. And chances are that our church in a life cycle, when it grows and it goes up and down, we find bits and pieces of each of these churches represented in the lifespan of the local congregation. So as we read them, we read them into our context as a church body, but we also read them into our life because it's addressing the completeness of the church. And then it goes on to describe uh, where this authority is coming from. And so it kind of gives us a picture of the Trinity. The Trinity is not something covered in Scripture, but what's referred to when we talk about the Father, God, the Creator, Jesus, His Son, who came to die for us so that we can live in Him and the Holy Spirit, which is promised to live inside of those who believe, to comfort, convict, and encourage each of us. And listen to the descriptions given here. God is referred to as the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. That's an allusion, or a reference back to the I am of the Old Testament. So I am in the past, I always was. I am in the future, I always will be, and I am right now. Every time span, every, everything that you're going through, I am there. Was, is, is to come. He goes on later to describe himself as the Alpha, the Omega. It's the Greek alphabet. It's, it's the A and the Z. And that's what's important. And then uh, to describe the Spirit, it says this, the seven spirits who were before his throne. And you're thinking, well, I thought there was just one Holy Spirit. What's this deal with seven? What does seven mean? Complete. And so we're talking about the Holy Spirit of God being complete in what it, it means. So the complete Spirit of God before His throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the for, firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings on earth. The supremacy of Christ is what's mentioned here. He is the King of kings. He rules over all things in all places. So any ruler, anywhere, He's above them. Okay? We need to get that supremacy of Christ in what's being referred to here, as well as the salvation piece, because he is the firstborn from among the dead. Okay? He was crucified, buried, but the grave couldn't stop him. He resurrected from the dead, which gives you and I hope that we too can be raised from the dead. Despite all of our sins, Christ covers that with his blood, and we have another chance. And so that is... Uh, the, the element that's being proclaimed here. And it says that he is coming soon. Behold, verse 7, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. So Jesus is coming back. And he wants to, his audience to know that before you even get very far in the letter. I have conquered death, and I'm coming back. Okay, I'm coming for you. I'm coming to redeem you. I'm coming to free you. I'm coming to give you life abundantly. I'm coming back. And everybody's going to see it. This isn't some secret of Jesus' return. He's not just a, appearing to a few people and everybody else doesn't know about it. Everybody, good, bad, and ugly, is going to know when Jesus shows up. Verse 9. 
I, John, your brother and partner in tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John is writing to a church that's facing persecution. It, they could easily lose their life because they identified with Christ, because they gathered together to worship Jesus as the Son of God. Could have easily been tortured and tormented. Could have themselves been exiled to a faraway place. John himself is on this small island called Patmos, just off of the coast of what is now Turkey, writing to Ephesus on the mainland. Okay, he's been persecuted for his faith. Some even say that he was boiled alive in, in oil. Man, that is just crazy to imagine the intense persecution, the, the human disfigurement that would come along with something like that. And John really, when he's writing to the church, says, guys, you're not alone. I'm, I'm there with you. And maybe some of you today, you're coming into the church and you're dealing with a heavy heart. You're struggling with some things in life. And you simply need to hear the words from John that you are not alone. Like somebody else knows the road you're walking. Somebody else has been there and done that. Actually, it says in the book of 2 Corinthians, as Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, like when we've been comforted through the tough stuff, that's so that we, you and I, can go back and comfort those who also are dealing with the tough stuff. You're not alone. And he is, he's in the persecution, but not just any kind of persecution. It's because of the testimony of Jesus. It's because of the gospel account. It says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I had a vision on Sunday, the day of the resurrection. And I heard behind me a voice like a loud trumpet. In other words, there was no denying it. Like you can sleep through this alarm. It's got your attention. And so he hears this, and I don't know if you're seeing it in your translation the way I'm seeing it in mine. Mine, it appears in red. So Jesus is talking, and he says, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Samaria, and to Pergamum, and Thyatira, and Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And then I turn to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. We see at the end of chapter one that the seven lampstands represents the seven churches. Okay, and what do lamps do? They shine light, right? So the churches are to be the light of the world. And so there among the churches, the light of the world is standing someone who looks like the son of man, clothed in a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The description of the person standing there, which we, we believe is Jesus, is a descriptor that's used of three different uh, types of people. You have the prophets of the Old Testament. They wore special garments that signified them as being spokesmen of God. You have the priests who interceded on behalf of the people before God. And you also have the kings in their royal garments. And so those are the three types of people that would wear this long flowing garment and this gold sash. What an accurate picture of who Jesus is. The prophet of God, the priest interceding on behalf of you and I, and the king. The king of all kings. And it's him, Jesus, who's standing amongst the churches, the seven golden lampstands, who are supposed to be shining brightly. And his hairs on his head were white like white wool, like snow, perfection. Some of us maybe would refer to that as, you know, the old age has set in, white hair, there's some wisdom there. His eyes were like a flame of fire, the kind of fire that refines and, and draws out impurities to make things better. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in the furnace. And his voice was like the roar of, of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And that's a whacked up picture of Jesus. Well, let's just be honest. But the figurative language that's used there is powerful. That he is the king of kings. He is glorious. He is dressed in splendor. And he is holding the seven stars. 
We're going to come back to that in a minute because he refers to that when he's writing to the, the Ephesians. Okay, so he who holds the seven stars. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. John says in his gospel account in 14 verse 6, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Jesus holds the keys to death and can give people eternal life. And so here's that comfort piece coming again from chapter 1. John says, you're not alone. I know what it's like to go through tough times. I know what it's like to be persecuted for my faith. And Jesus, Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. Jesus is alive though he was crucified. Jesus has the key for you to overcome death, for you to overcome persecution. So not, no matter what life is throwing your way, know that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the hope. Jesus is the life. And so there's a promise for you and I. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that will take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars, they're in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, a protector, a messenger for each of those churches represented, again, completeness. And the seven lampstands that are the seven churches. Now as we transition here, we're going to take on this first letter to the very first church. So the first letter is written to the church in Ephesus. There's also a book in the Bible, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to that same church called Ephesians. That's why it's got the name. Okay, so as, as he's writing to the church in Ephesus, it starts off with the words of Jesus himself. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write. So to that messenger who's going to deliver it to the people. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I'm going to show you a picture of a coin. On this coin is a, a picture of one of the uh, Roman emperors, Domitian. Now the emperors would oftentimes craft money after their own ego. And so he did that. Many of the Roman emperors were declared gods after they died. The thing that was maybe a little bit more interesting about Domitian is that he had an ego the size of Texas. And he declared himself God before he ever died, like towards the beginning of his reign. And in the second uh, picture there, you see a, a, a tails side of the coin, if you will. Go back to the other slide. On the tails side of the coin is a man sitting on a globe with seven stars. This is Domitian, a God reigning over the world along with the others. And so when Jesus is addressing the church in Ephesus, what he's really saying is, Domitian ain't your daddy. I'm your daddy. Right? I am the king of kings, the lord of lords. There is no governor, no politician who has authority over you that I do not have authority over. And so these people in this context knew to him who holds the seven stars, there was some authority to this picture. And so Jesus is, is the one that you and I maybe need to hear, that he has authority over all of the earth, over all of creation. And it's him alone that we need to seek out. And he's walking among the seven golden lampstands, the, the church. Verse 2, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduringly, enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and that you have not grown weary. First thing that for you and I, when we're getting a letter from Jesus, it's tough to hear, but he says, I know your works. I know your works. 
He goes on to tell them, like, I know your turmoil. I know, I know the, the immense pressure that you're under. I know that there are lots of false teachers around you, and you're spotting them, and you're turning them away. You're protecting the, the, the gospel message. You're keeping it pure. You're keeping it holy. You're fighting off all this stuff. You're patiently enduring. I guess the scary part about this is when Jesus writes you and I a letter, he already knows our works. So the stuff that we try to hide in the back closet, in the back room, he already knows. He knows where we've been and what we've done. He knows what we're not yet to do. And the scary thing about this for, for me is that he knows thoughts as well. He knows my motives behind why I do what I do. He knows the things that, you know, I'm pretty good at putting a mask on and pretending like everything's all right, but I'm kind of angry under the surface, frustrated, ticked off maybe about some of the things that are happening, whether they're injustices in the world or personal injustices, you know, my own little pet peeves. He knows the thoughts going behind that. He knows the internal motivations and he knows yours. So Jesus, as he's writing to the, the church in Ephesus, guys, I know you. I know your works. And you're doing a good job. I mean, this is, this is the attaboy from Jesus. You're doing a good job. You, you know the, the, the gospel message, and they didn't have it in a nice leather binding like we do, but they, they would hear the message, and they would apply the message, and they, they would stick true to the message, and they would stand up against all the opposition. Good job, guys. You're awesome. One of the uh, gods that they would have had to stand up against was the Roman emperor. We talked about that. Uh, some believe that in this epicenter of, of popularity, it was about 250,000 people that would have lived in Ephesus. Imagine trying to figure out uh, the, the plumbing system in Ephesus before modern day toilets. Uh, I actually saw a picture online of just like some stone that was carved out with a hole in the middle. That was the public facilities. 250,000 people. I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. That just that's, that seems strange. But they worshipped a ton of gods. Some counted up as many as 50 different gods and goddesses that they would worship. And they had legalized prostitution. Archaeologists have even discovered a tunnel that goes from the library uh, to the local, uh, you know, the local hangout for the prostitutes. And so I don't know if it was like the guys going, hey, hey, honey, I'm going to go study. And then they check out more than just books. But this was just an okay thing. One of the gods, and there's actually a statue of her there, is a god that we would refer to as Nike. Check this out. This logo here, Nike, you thought you were just wearing shoes on your feet. Nike is the goddess of victory. Okay? The, the swoosh that's become so iconic was meant to represent Nike's wings. And we worship a false god on our feet. And some of us, we turn to other false gods of like Reebok and Fila. And not Adidas anymore. That's been thrown out. And we're trying to figure out how to, uh, to navigate all of the different things calling our attention. You guys, I know that anytime I talk about the many different gods that people serve, it's easy to look back in Scripture and go, oh, well, we don't have that. Like we don't have this god and this goddess and this pole and this uh, table and this sacrifice and... Yet at the same time, we have so many different things vying for our time and our attention and our money. We have so many false gods around us. Uh, the gods of popularity, the gods of success, the gods of affluence, the gods of our family, the gods of a job well done, the gods of entertainment, and yet we're trying to figure out how to stand up under that. The answer really is the gospel, right? You get into the gospel, you hear the words, and you begin to apply them in your life. Information plus application equals transformation. And then you too can stand up against those false gods coming in. But we move on. He says, yet this I have against you. So we have some good stuff. We have some, well, not so good stuff. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Love was the missing link. We know from the New Testament accounts, also written by John, that if you don't have love, you don't have much of anything. 
Like Jesus is love. God is love. They will know we are Christians by our... Some of you were there. They will know we are Christians by our love, right? And so Paul, as he's writing to the church in Corinth, tells them there's all these different spiritual gifts and you're awesome at doing this and they're awesome at doing that and you're together, you're one body, but he who has not love. It's nothing but a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. And so these people are doing so much right. They're in a, a midst of this polygamous society who's chasing after all these other gods. And they're standing up underneath that with the gospel account, but they've forgotten their first love. That's a big deal. Let's read on. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and I'll remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. You see, these people were so busy building walls to protect the church and protect the people inside of the church that they forgot they were a lampstand. They forgot that they were supposed to be shining their light for all the world to see. We still can struggle with this today. We get into our own little holy huddle. We exclude ourselves from the world around us. We're so focused on the truth that we forget to love other people. The problem is this, that, that we need both love and truth. You see, it's not love if we're not approaching people in truth. That's just a lie. Right? And we do that a lot of times. We, we love on other people, but we deny the truth. And we lie to them. But yet, if we give somebody truth without love, like these guys in Ephesus were doing, that's not really true love. That's not the love that comes from God. God's love is both truth and love. We give them the whole shebang. And we do it in a way that encourages them and supports them and builds them up because that's the way that God wants it. It's like Jesus would be saying to you and I, I love the world so much, I love you so much that I'm willing to send my one and only son to die for you in your place. You know the passage? And you and I, we're, we're okay with that because we're pretty, pretty hot stuff at times. And Jesus died for me. And sometimes we think, oh man, that's really hard to, to grasp because Jesus, he knows my works, he knows my thoughts. So I can't imagine how he loved me enough to die for me. But hopefully we understand his love enough that it drives us to love him back. And that's one of the reasons you and I gather together in this place we call church. Right? With a group of people who are like-minded because Jesus loved us enough to die for us and so we want to live our lives for him. And a, a willing sacrifice says in Romans, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That's what we do. But Jesus has this other part, like when he's offering this, I love you so much. We go back to Mark chapter 12. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength with all of you. And the second is like it. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. Guys, hey, this is Jesus here. I love you. Love me too. By the way, there's other people I love. They're sitting around you and I want you to love them also. So we can miss that point. But the solution is to remember what you did at first. You ever have this issue where you're, you're getting up and you go to the other room and there's something important that you're going to do. And as soon as you cross the threshold into that other room, you go, what was I here for? Anybody else? And so sometimes I'll go back to the other room, sit where I was sitting, try to think what I was thinking, try to watch what I was watching. Try to think what it was that interrupted my train of thought before I went to the other room. Just so that I could come up with this thing that I went to go get. Usually comes to me a couple hours later. You know, after you get that phone call that said, Hey, did you do this thing? Uh, <laughs> I meant to. I meant to do that. But this is the key, guys. When we've forgotten our love, we remember what we did at first. We repent. We stop doing the wrong thing and we go back to doing the right thing. And so for the Ephesians, they needed to stop living inside of their own little uh, Christian community where they've built these walls. They needed to shine the light into the community they've been placed in. Go back and remember how much Jesus loved you, and that's how much I want you to love other people. And that was the goal. He says, yet this you have. 
You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Nicolaitans was a derivative of that name, Nike. So these were the people who worshipped that God of victory. Look at how he brings this home. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, some of you may have a different word in your Bible. It may say something like victory, victorious. To the one who is victorious, you're standing up against Nike, right? But the victory is in Jesus. I will grant to eat of the tree of life. So to the one who holds true to Jesus, who loves Jesus and loves his people, to the one who shines their light brightly, Jesus is giving us the opportunity to eat from the tree of life. We're going back to Genesis, the tree of life. It's also at the end of Revelation when he brings down a new Jerusalem, the tree of life. That's an important deal. But also something that we lose in the translation is outside of Ephesus was this garden. They called it paradise. Guys, you think you got paradise sitting right out your city walls. I'm telling you, the tree of life is in the paradise of God. And then the tree of life is Jesus. And in that is hope. And to those who repent, to those who turn to God, to those who hear his word and apply it in their life, man, you are victorious and you will get the crown of life. So what's your next step? What's your next step? Maybe for you today is simply to be a proclaimer of the good news of Jesus. You've simply sat there letting somebody else to do what you should be doing because blessed are those who proclaim, who share the good news. Maybe you need to be right where you are and you need to be receiving the good news. You need to be allowing it to minister into your life, into your heart, into the, the nine to five job that you've got, into your home life. And so you need to receive it. But that information, if it's not applied, guys, it's dead. It's meaningless. It's lost. And so many of us, we sit and we study God's word, but we fail to apply it. And maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe today, from the, the first chapter of Revelation, you simply need to, to understand that in your suffering, you are not alone. Guys, in this church, in this family of God, there are others who are suffering. You are not alone. There are others who have overcome. You are not alone. But Jesus alone gives you the victory. He is the one that holds the keys to death and Hades. Right? He is the one who brings life. And maybe you need to remember that you are the church. You are the light. You are the lampstand that's supposed to be shining bright. That you, you preach the word in truth, but you share it in love. Guys, I don't know what your step is today. But I do know something. The victory is still in Jesus. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for his sacrifice for the life that he's lived and for the testimony that's left behind through John in this letter to the church in Ephesus. Father, help us to remember that you have already conquered. So the struggles that we face, the difficulties that come our way, that Jesus holds the keys. Help us to be able to find that kind of comfort, that kind of peace in life that we can we can get through the tough times, that we can, we can be a testimony of patiently enduring and guide us into your truth. That Jesus can look at us and go, well, I know your works and how you're standing up against all the false doctrines and the false teachers. You're sticking true to the gospel. But along the way, Father, help us to continue to be beacons of light and sharers of love. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.